Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles, the series of books and videos on American history as seen through the lives of the presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of Calvin Coolidge, and the focus is the Roaring Twenties. The year is 1924. Coolidge has just been elected in his own term as President of the United States, and he's overseen the country at a time of great change, great cultural change in this post-World War uh, environment where people are pushing for, for new freedom. You've got the jazz era that's coming on scene. Women, the rights of women, they get the right to vote in the Constitution, also emerging in the workplace, but also culturally, pushing the boundaries on traditional roles as flappers started coming on the scene, and women were in making innovations and leading innovations rather in dancing and in fashion. Plus, this was the era of the celebrity coming onto the scene. Celebrities and movie stars and athletes. Plus, you've got prohibition going on, the banning of alcohol, but that gave rise to speakeasies and the role of the mob. So, a very dynamic era going on in the 1920s compared to the clean-cut, straight-laced man that had just been elected to serve four years in the White House. Quite a contrast. Gamaliel Bradford wrote that it would be possible to make an equally effective contrast contrast between the mad, hurrying, chattering, extravagant, self-indulgent harlotry of 20th century America and the grave, silent, stern, narrow, uncomprehending New England Puritanism of Calvin Coolidge. Quite a contrast. One of Coolidge's most oft-quoted speeches came during this interregnum, January of 1925, when he spoke to the American Society of Newspaper Editors in Washington, D.C. Now, the quote that most people refer to Coolidge about was this one. After all, the chief business of the American people is business. Now, that's not a surprise given the focus of the economy that we're going to talk about in this episode for Calvin Coolidge, but the context of this speech is actually very much forgotten, and it's important as he looked at the overall context of that, that important element of business. He also went on to say, we make no concealment of the fact that we want wealth, but there are many other things we want much more. We want peace and honor, and that charity which is so strong an element of all civilizations. As Coolidge uh, unveiled these themes that he talked about for these newspaper editors, there's two sides of the news business both of which are important. There's the business side, the job to make money, that's important. The editorial side, the chance to serve a purpose, that's also important. And it's this combination of things that actually Coolidge was really trying to convey to these newspaper editors. And then he came with his next comment. He said that the chief ideal of the American people is idealism. I cannot repeat too often that America is a nation of idealists. That's the only motive to which they ever give any strong and lasting reaction. So yes, the chief business of the American people is business, but that's only part of the equation that Calvin Coolidge in this context is actually important to remember. Now, we go forward to the inauguration day, March 4th of 1925. Uh, Vice President Charles Dawes is inaugurated first, and then it's Coolidge's turn. Now, both of Coolidge's swearing-in ceremonies had an unprecedented nature to them. The first time, he was sworn in by his father uh, at the passing of President Warren Harding at his father's uh, farm in Plymouth Notch, Vermont. Only time that a president has been inaugurated or sworn in by, his, by a relative. Well, there was also something unprecedented here in the 1925 inaugural, because he was inaugurated or rather, again, given the oath of office by a former president. That had never happened before, and that's because William Taft was now the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. That's the job he had always wanted. He had actually missed out on that earlier in his career. He became president, didn't really like that part of his, his career very much, and he was thrilled when Warren Harding put him on, put him on the bench. He here's his chance to swear Calvin Coolidge into office, a former president, to the next president. Now, for Calvin Coolidge, he gave his uh, address, the economy, a big part of that address, and he talked about his pension for cutting government spending for a purpose. According to Coolidge, I favor the policy of economy, not because I wish to save money, but because I wish to save people. Economy is idealism in its most practical form. The wise and correct course to follow in taxation and all other economic legislation is not to destroy those who have already secured success, but to create conditions under which everyone will have a better chance to be successful. And this was the motivation for Calvin Coolidge to work with his budget director time and time again. This is a General uh, Herbert Lord to cut wherever he could. 25,000 there, 50,000 there. If you needed more new furniture in one federal agency, well, let's go find some used furniture in another agency if they have excess rather than buy new. In one agency, they had a policy about pencils. Everybody got one pencil, and you didn't get another pencil until you came back and it was down to the stub 
that's when you got another one. So all these little things really started to add up as they brought the federal budget outlays down under $3 billion, which was really quite a significant cut compared to what was when Harding took over at the beginning of his administration. They're actually now running surpluses, pretty big surpluses throughout this era of the Roaring Twenties, about $900 million of extra money coming into the federal government off a $3 billion budget. There's really nothing like that had ever happened in American history. Well, there's some changes at the start of the Coolidge administration here in 1925, changes in the cabinet. Charles Evans Hughes stepped down as Secretary of State. He was replaced by Frank Kellogg, who had been serving as the uh, ambassador to Great Britain. Also, so Harlan Stone was out as attorney general. Well, not because he quit, but because Coolidge put his friend on the Supreme Court. That created an opening for actually another friend, a man that uh, Coolidge had known for many, many years from his days in Vermont. John Sargent was the new attorney general. Congress was in recess for most of the next several months before it would come back in December, but a lot of work being done behind the scenes. On the administration side, you had Coolidge working with Andrew Mellon, his Secretary of the Treasury, on a tax plan, and some members of the House Ways and Means Committee hanging out in Washington to actually create new legislation to fix what had been very disappointing in the results of the Revenue Act of 1924 that had been passed uh, previously under Coolidge's watch. He wanted a lot of that stuff fixed here in the 1926 legislation, which he introduced to his annual message in December of 1925. Speaking to Congress, he said, all these economic results are being sought not to benefit the rich, but to benefit the people. They're for the purpose of a encouraging industry in order that employment may be, may be plentiful. They seek to make business good in order that wages may be good. They seek to lay the foundation which through increased production may give the people a more bountiful supply of the necessities of life. By all these means, attempting to strengthen the spiritual life of the nation, all with a purpose in terms of enhancing the economy. In fact, Coolidge told them on that day, he wanted tax legislation by, May, by March 15th so it could go into effect for the current tax year. In fact, Congress took the message and they got him that legislation early and it was significant. The cuts in the top rates that Coolidge had wanted back in 1924, he got here in, in the 26 legislation, bringing down that top rate to 25%. He also had uh, a, a cut to the gift tax. He had the elimination of that sort of weird provision that actually made tax returns public. That had only happened for a couple of years and would never happen again in American history. Those would become private once again. And also there was a change at the bottom end of the tax mechanism so that people's exemptions before you had to pay any taxes was raised to $4,000. That meant about 40% fewer Americans would pay any ta income tax in the next year than it paid in the previous year. So significant change in the tax proposals and it really had an impact leading to what the Roaring Twenties saw was unprecedented prosperity for the American people. The unemployment hovering maybe around 5% or so for basically the full decade. Labor produ productivity growth was almost unprecedented. You had a rise in wages up about 25% from the beginning of the decade to the end of the decade. Stock market, which we'll talk about more in a couple of ep episodes in the future, that was obvious also on the rise. Now for Coolidge, there were three primary reasons for all of this economic growth and expansion that were occurring here in the Roaring Twenties. According to Coolidge, our present state of prosperity has been greatly promoted by three important causes, one of which is economy, resulting in reduction uh, reduction and reform in national taxation. Another is the elimination of many kinds of waste. The third is the general raising of the standards of efficiency. Now those first two were very much the policies of the Coolidge administration. The last one on efficiency, yes, the administration had something to do with that, but so did the general marketplace and economic uh, well-being of the American people because this was an era of innovation. It was an era of innovation in how products were manufactured. You had Henry Ford's assembly line that was now being used by all kinds of uh, manufacturing organizations in order to bring the cost down through greater efficiency of manufacturing products. Plus, you had innovation in the projects themselves that were available at reasonable cost and they were exploding across the country. The telephone, the radio, vacuum cleaners, washing machines, these kinds of uh, helpful tools, people were gobbling them up with their excess cash that they had available because the prices were reasonable, creating jobs, prosperity, reigning across, spurring the economy under the policies of the administration of Calvin Coolidge, certainly a part of this element of the Roaring 
1920s. Now, there were some limitations on presidents, and Coolidge was not immune from this. He was sort of existing in a bubble, not a lot of personal freedoms. He, you know, he shared some introspection in a letter to his father uh, at the start of this full term as president, in which he said, I suppose I'm the most powerful man in the world, but great power does not mean much except great limitations. I cannot have any freedom even to go and come. I am only in the clutch of forces that are greater than I am. So there's a cost to being president of the United States, but this is all part of that responsibility. Now, as for Coolidge's father, he is not doing well. He had actually recently suffered a stroke. He knows that the men end is probably coming near. Coolidge wanted to come to him to come to Washington, D.C., where he could make him comfortable and take care of him. But John Coolidge, a very proud man, he had lived his entire life in Plymouth Notch. He wanted to die in his own home. Coolidge did get him to agree to install a telephone for the first time in his home, and Coolidge would call his dad one or two times a day during this, this last stage of his life. March 1926, he finally got the call that his father was really fading. He really needed to get there if he wanted to say goodbye. Got uh, on the train with his wife, Grace. It was a massive snowstorm. They had to make the final trek from Ludlow actually in a sleigh. And by the time they arrived at Plymouth Notch, Plymouth Notch at the Coolidge home, John Coolidge had already died. So he just missed out. Uh, after the funeral, now you've got in that uh, Plymouth Notch Cemetery, Coolidge's father, his mother, his sister, one of his children, but the most important in terms of influence of all of those on Coolidge's life was really his father, John Coolidge, the man he wanted to emulate his entire life and also wanted to impress. He was now gone. Well, he also now had to deal with Congress as he came back from his summer recess and Congress came back as well. It was going to be a little bit more difficult because in the midterm elections, uh, the Republicans had lost some seats, still had majorities, but kind of tenuous majorities. Congress wanted to spend that excess cash. This was an era of surpluses, and they wanted, it was popular, chance to get votes. They wanted to spend it on sort of targeted pet projects, one of which was agriculture, the one part of the economy that was still struggling to sort of make it into this great reign of prosperity that everyone else was experimenting. And it was something called the McNary-Haugen Bill. Congress brought it forth almost every year, a different version of this, but the principal idea was put aside $250 million to guarantee at a certain price any excess production from American farmers. So just because they couldn't sell that production in the U.S. market, Congress, or rather the federal government, would buy that, that excess at a guaranteed price to ensure some profits for the farmers. And then they try to sell that excess uh, agricultural products in Europe. And even if they took a loss on it, this was still good for the American economy not for Calvin Coolidge. This was not a proper role for the federal government. Calvin Coolidge is one of the most conservative presidents in American history, and he believed there was a specific role for the federal government and roles for the state and local governments. And this was part of his belief in the concept of federalism, principle that he talked about in one of his annual messages. The greatest solicitude should be exercised to prevent any encroachment upon the rights of the states or their various political subdivisions. Local self-government is one of our most precious possessions. It is the greatest contributing factor to the stability, strength, liberty, and progress of the nation. This was part of his conservative message. And, you know, when times are good, it's kind of easy to make this kind of a statement. But what about when things are not so good and parts of the country are suffering. That's when sort of this tension arises. It was arising in the area of the agricultural uh, sector, but also arising now because there was a massive set of storms that inundated the Mississippi Valley from 1926 to early 1927. 27,000 square miles were underwater. Massive relief was gonna be needed for this as it was the biggest floods really in the history the country had seen. The role of the federal government though, as far as Calvin Coolidge uh, determined, well, the federal departments have no funds for relief. So again, his conception of the role of the federal government versus the state and local governments had a very distinct responsibility in his conservative perspective. And while this may have felt a harsh or unfeeling, it was consistent with his political belief. Now, he was not blind to the needs of the people in the Mississippi Valley. He made his Commerce Secretary, Herbert Hoover, available to try to help coordinate some of the relief efforts. Hoover had done so much miraculous work in coordinating food relief for the people of Belgium during uh, World War I. But mainly, Hoover was working with the Red Cross and other organizations to raise private funds to help uh, provide relief. Now, they did convince the president to make available some surplus army tents and cots and blankets. And so that was good news uh, for the people who needed uh, some kind of relief. But there were no 
federal funds available in Coolidge's administration on this topic. Now, there was an Arkansas senator by the name of Thaddeus Carraway who said, I venture to say that if a similar disaster had affected New England, the president would have had no hesitation in calling an extra session of Congress in order to perhaps get some federal funds for relief. Well, he was wrong because a year later, the state of Vermont actually suffered its worst floods in its history. Roads and bridges were washed away. 84 people were killed. The lieutenant governor was swept away trying to get out of his car. He died in this. Millions of dollars needed for the state of Vermont to recover. But Carraway was not right. Calvin Coolidge was a man of principle. His views of federalism were no federal funds were going to be available, even for his home state of Vermont. He made Herbert Hoover available to help try to coordinate some of the private sector response, but from a uh, federal government standpoint, no direct aid even in his own state of Vermont. Herbert Hoover was a fan of this new, another element of the Roaring Twenties, the commercial aviation. In fact, he had, he had advocated a $3 million appropriation for Congress to get involved in sort of regulating this new industry. There were still too many accidents. Some people were still skittish about it, but Coolidge really thought this was going to be a wave of the future. In the Roaring Twenties, this was an era that people were thinking big. One of them was Ray Ortig. Ray Ortig put out a prize, $25,000 for the first person to fly direct, nonstop from New York to Paris. Well, he put that out in 1919, and eight years later, nobody still had collected, even though more and more efforts, almost every month or every other month, somebody now trying, many of those uh, pilots were lost at sea, never to be seen again. The next one up, and this is in May of 1927, is 25-year-old Charles Lindbergh. Lindbergh I designed uh, his craft, a monoplane, the Spirit of St. Louis, specifically for this venture. He loaded up with 450 gallons of gasoline, uh, of, air, of jet fuel, and almost nothing else, because to keep the, the plane as light as possible, and he had a fan in the White House. As Coolidge thought, you know, say he actually sent him a telegram wishing Lindbergh the best of luck, and he was closely monitoring as Lindbergh left New York 33 and a half hours later, landed in Paris, and there was a celebration around the world, including remarks immediately from Calvin Coolidge. The more we learn of his accomplishment in going from New York to Paris, the greater it seems to have been. Coolidge welcomed Lindbergh to Washington, D.C. In fact, him and his mother came and spent some time with Coolidge and Grace. They actually became friendly, uh, and, and that friendship lasted uh, well beyond this, this immediate period. Massive celebration. Some 300,000 people showed up at the Washington Monument, where Coolidge presided over the celebration for Lindbergh's feet. He also gave him the uh, Distinguished Flying Cross in a smaller ceremony, and the following year awarded Lindbergh with the Medal of Honor. Very rare for anybody to get that outside of combat. That's how big a deal that Coolidge thought this feat was by, uh, by Charles Lindbergh. Another great breakthrough here in the Roaring Twenties. Mostly the Roaring Twenties, though, the biggest thing was the economy, really the greatest economic decade in American history from 1920 to 1929. Uh, you've got surpluses almost every year by cutting taxes, decreasing spending, still able to lower the debt, keep unemployment low, wages were up, stock market up, prosperity reigning throughout this period of the Roaring Twenties, all under the presidency of Calvin Coolidge. That's Calvin Coolidge and the Roaring Twenties from the life of Calvin Coolidge. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher. This is Presidential Chronicles.